Yeah.
Gentlemen, Mardis. <laughs> Incredible stuff. And amazing to hear George live. Yeah, that, that was the voice of the podcast right at the beginning. Slightly lower voice now that he's, yeah. he's croaked out. He's croaked Poor out a bit. He's pro- croaked out a bit. <laughs> I tried to keep him young, but it didn't work. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Throughout the rest of this whole podcast, if uh, Jamie and I ever say the interplanetary podcast, You've got, they know the shout, response. you've got to all shout out what? Okay, nice. we'll try it again, I'm but this time slightly it. with a bit more conviction this time. Right, here we go. The Interplanetary Podcast. Putting the ace back into space! Woo! You know, I quite, right. I quite like a bit of emphasis on the back. Can we try that one more time? It's the Interplanetary Podcast. Putting the ace back into space! <laughs> now we're rocking. Now we are rocking. So here we are. We are in Arthur C. Clarke House. Jamie's going to read the wise words of the man himself. If man survives for as long as the least successful of the dinosaurs, those creatures whom we often deride as nature's failures, then we may be certain of this. For all but a vanishingly brief instant near the dawn of history, the word ship will mean spaceship. Spaceship. Arthur C. Clarke. Sir Arthur C. Clarke. Sir Arthur C. Clarke. So, yes, Arthur C. Clarke was, and is, would have been 100 years old, the same as the podcast is in episodes. Yeah, episodes. Right, okay, so that's that's good, right? So, born... We're looking good for it. Yeah, he's all right. So, it'll be 101 in 16th of December, 19... Well, in this year, it'll be 101. He was born in 1917. There's me fluffing my lines. Okay, so he joined the BIS in 1934. That's how old. The oldest space advocacy society in the entire world. And you're sitting here right now, breathing in the history. We reckon that Arthur C. Clarke touched this. (laughs) Right, there we go. So I'm, I'm now... Got a bit of DNA yeah, on Yeah, there was all talk of some kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, Jurassic Park scenario, but we won't go there quite yet. So he joined, but by 1946, he'd become the chairman. Yes, the chairman. And he did that for a year and then did it again, 1951 to 1953. But what he's most famous for, in some ways, other than his ridiculously ace science fiction, i.e., 2001, A Space Odyssey, The Sentinel, etc., etc., etc. He's quite famous for this. Space Word of the Week. What is the Space Word of the Week this week, Jamie? Matt, it's only geostationary transfer orbit. Whoa, no. There's three just, words, but... Just geostationary orbit. Should we just take that? No, yeah, just no. Geostationary orbit. That's what I'm Now, hands up. I know this isn't good for a podcast, but hands up who knows what this is. Oh, God. I, I asked that in the wrong building, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, the geo. Because it's weird, because I asked that in the pub last night. No one knew it. Really? Weird. Well, they're not half the C. Clark fans. Yeah, that's true. That's Get true. this. He's so associated with the geostationary orbit, which he popularised. He didn't actually invent it. It had sort of come up a few times, but he kind of popularised it and said, do you know what? We could put communication satellites up. And not only that, communication satellites are up in this bizarre bit where, you know what an orbit is? As you sort of go around the Earth, you're falling at the same rate that the Earth is curving away from you. But there has to be a point where you're falling at exactly the same rate that the Earth's rotating underneath you. So you stay, if you look at that little picture, you stay in the same spot as it goes over. And that's known as geostationary orbit. Look at those graphics. And also known... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is... This is, is this 8K, man? No, we're living 8K? in the future. This is it. This is, we are living in the future. The future that Arthur C. Clarke predicted, he did, Jamie. He did, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's absolutely true. So, yes, it's called the Clarke Belt. And it's exactly 35,786 kilometres, which is what in miles, Jamie? Oh, I'm just going to hazard a guess at... <laughs> 
22,236. Yeah, it's about that. It's about yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> no notes in front of me. <laughs> so, uh, does anyone know what the first satellite placed into geostationary orbit was? Jerry, you know. Come on, Jerry. It is Syncom. Oh, my God. As if we you're surprised. <laughs> As if. What, what did it launch on? Delta D, yes, let check that out. Someone knows their raspberries. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, so the, the satellite in a geostationary orbit will have the footprint that looks exactly the same on the ground. So it's one of those really boring satellites that when you go out in your garden at night and see satellites flying over, it doesn't. It just looks like a little tiny star and you wouldn't Aww. know any different. Poor, lonely. Beautiful geostationary satellite. So a little bit about where we are right now. There's a little satellite image of the British Interplanetary so Society with one of its most famous achievements, which is Daedalus. Daedalus, Daedalus. Easy for you What's to say. Daedalus. Let's call it Daedalus. So yes, formed in 1933. 1933. And I know that there's someone from this town. Formed in Liverpool. Shout out for the Liverpool Massive. Yes, Chris. Yes. That's yes, it. Yes, Chris Carney. Yes. <laughs> that's it. That's it. It is. You, you've you've You're answered done. it, right? You're done. So, what has the BIS ever done for us? Go on. Hit well, me, Matt, in the 1930s, they devised a project of landing people on the moon by multi-stage rocket with a lunar lander, very much like Apollo. So, yeah. Think that, of that. They invented... What I'm trying to say here is they invented space flight. Pretty much. Pretty much. Not in this building, but the, but the people involved. Right. So, R.A. Smith, and I've mentioned this book that I managed to uh, procure from Amazon for about a fiver, but which he invented the Coalostat, the first navigational mechanism which would cancel out the rotating view. It's the first space instrument ever invented. It's my favourite kind yeah. of stat. <laughs> what else? Well... They also, um, author, well, Smith also authored and illustrated the 1947 book, The Exploration of the Moon. Text by? Text by Arthur C. Clarke, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which inspired John F. Kennedy and Stanley Kubrick. Absolutely. Right? So, yeah, absolutely. 1978, the, pub, the Society published a starship chart. Star <laughs> Put your teeth in. Put your teeth in. A starship study called... Daedalus, and there it is. Daedalus is the first proper study by Alan Bond, who we interviewed early on this year, literally a genius and should be. Ah. Uh, he, uh, yeah, so he, he looked at actually flying to another star, in this case, Bernard Star. And uh, he devised this, he and the team at the BIS devised how they were going to get it, and that is it. Am I right, Jerry? Am I telling a complete porky pie here? Uh, Am I right? I've few. No porky pies go, yet. Go, go. What else have they done, Jamie? Come well, on. Matt, in the 1940s, uh, the group had planned for a suborbital space flight by converted V2 rocket as Mega Rock. Mega Rock. Yes, yeah, that's my so, kind of rock. Yeah, that's the, if, if only they'd carried on with that and Britain could have been the first, you know, we could have had our own John Glenn or Yuri Gagarin. Yeah. So, Glass. yes, there's been loads of things. Basically, the BAS have continually developed space flight over the years. Even to the present day, they're doing stuff right the way up to encouraging government to give us spaceports and stuff like that. So good on the BIS. And thank you very much, Jill, for letting us be in the BIS. It's a, literally a privilege. Thank yes. you. Yes. Can we have a round of applause, please, for the for British Jill. Interplanetary Society? Okay. Yay space. I like that. More, sh more shout outs of that, please. <laughs> well, the Interplanetary Podcast. Right, there's only one other thing that you need to pay attention to, and that is whenever we mention Elon Musk. Drink. Drink. Yes. Drink. drink. It's quite Doesn't an matter easy. if it's soft drink, just such drink. An, such an easy. Yeah. Water's fine. fine. It would fine. be once over the age of 16, it must be alcoholic. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but please don't anymore. spill anything because we've got quite a lot of wires in this room, haven't we, Matt? Yeah, There's lots going yeah, on. And don't spill on the very, very expensive heirlooms like this little fella. <laughs> so there we go. So that's the Elon Musk drinking game. Pay attention, okay? Right. So what else is celebrating its hundredth other than Arthur C. Clarke, the Interplanetary Podcast? It is 
Ariane 5 Ariane flew five. flew its 100th flight, and they did this deliberately to uh, as a, a mark of respect to the podcast. It's almost <laughs> like the planets have aligned, <laughs> isn't it? Absolutely. Really, really. It was so, so nice of them. Yeah. Didn't Thank even ask. I know. Thank you very much, Issa, for that fitting tribute, sort of red arrow styly. <laughs> Thank you. Right, so we got our first guest, who, uh, who I've tricked into coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Will Alicia Mayakankaya of Mars Nation please make her way? Please, to round the of stage. applause for Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got you early? I think we got you on slightly earlier than we said. That's good, isn't it? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, Alicia thought um, we were doing a normal podcast after speaking to Matt and that it was going to be at four o'clock. So she's been waiting around for a long time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry about. <laughs> And Sorry about Matt's I communication. Didn't know about any of this. <laughs> <laughs> so she's not not it? dressed in her like fancy clothes. I did yeah, say. I'm sure I said. But anyway, <laughs> we had that bit of confusion yeah, over. It's not the time. So we've had Alicia on before, and she's been talking about Mars Nation. She looks into really deep issues about what we need to do before we go to Mars. So what have you been up to this time, Alicia? What have you been up to? Okay. So, does anyone know about Mars Nation, by the way? That's a good call. For those who don't, those could you maybe just world, give us a brief, what is Mars Nation? Okay. So, Mars Nation is a startup that runs immersive events. And the whole idea is space travel, for some reason, became really boring. And <laughs> it's all about habituation. You have exactly the same people doing exactly the same thing. And if you have exactly the same thinking coming in, the same ideas come out. So what we decided to do is break the cycle and run events where we brainstorm some of the amazing challenges to space exploration. And we invite beginners. And the reason why we invite beginners is because they really break this habit. They can come up with stuff that experts haven't even thought about, which is really cool. And we make it fun. So but hang on a minute, you invited me and Matt. We're definitely not beginners, are we? <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, I, spe I suspect we yeah. gave quite a bit of expert room. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, you were experts, <laughs> definitely. So, yeah, th I have to say, how, how, how enjoyable were those? Sp they were really good. What That's did you think? It. They were really, really good. We, it was just that kind of networking with young people, trying to think about all like crazy ideas of, of all the things. Well, what, what we ended up with a... What was your favourite idea? I think we ended up with a uh, an AI seal to keep yeah, the... Yeah, this was about <laughs> mental health in space and how it's we look important. after our mental health. And I think, yeah, a, a kind of... To, is it a Tamagotchi type seal? Yeah, it's what they give. It's what the kids say, it's Matt. What they, you wouldn't know. It's what they give old people in J Japanese. That's care right, homes. nursing homes. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> and we yeah. thought it might be good on a space flight. Yeah, that's that was mine and Jamie's. Problem idea. solved. Problem solved. Done. <laughs> yeah. So that's you can right. go now. So no. So what have, <laughs> what have you been up to? What have you what have you been up to this time? Okay, so the two most important problems that we've come across are loneliness on Mars and over-socialization. And I spent the last three months living under a rock, researching loneliness, the fun thing ever, the most fun thing ever. And um, I pretty much deconstructed what loneliness is, which is kind of cool. Okay, could you give us that in some quick bullet points? What is okay. loneliness? Okay. Three bullet points. Okay, give me three. It. Okay. So one is actually understanding what loneliness is, because most people try to run away from it, but actually it's like being hungry. It's an evolutionary tool. Uh, so it's about accepting it. The second part is about meaningful connections and not superficial stuff. So just to give you an example, in the 80s, if you ask American people if they have anyone to call in the middle of the night, uh, to confine and talk about a difficult pro problem, they said they have three people to talk to. And now, 25% of those people say they have zero people, zero people to talk to. Really? Yeah. Uh, what do you put that down to? Uh, part of it is social media and superficial connections. So the more we spend time on social media, the more we compare ourselves to other people and the more disconnected we feel. Mm. Oosh. So Who feels disconnected on social media? Should we, should we cut the feed? Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any social media. Oh. I'm very lonely. 
Oh, oh what? So that's like a double whammy. £50, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. In instant charity. I, th I think you should be our next guest. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we do to combat this, Alicia? Uh, well, so that's what we're trying to figure out. And in a couple of months, we're running Mars Nation, where beginners and experts... <laughs> Uh, come in and solve loneliness problems. So we'll talk about all the research, everything we found, and we'll have an amazing neuroscientist uh, from King's talking about the neurological uh, things that happen in your brain while you feel lonely, which is kind of cool, and you'll decide for yourself. So you, you mentioned also that over-socialization. Over what the heck is that? If you're stuck with people that you don't want to be around with. <laughs> oh, Matt, this is awkward. Uh, should I leave? <laughs> this is me. Uh, this uh, is, is what you've done Is to this me. what's happening right now? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you were lonely outside and now you're being over-socialised. Over yeah. Is that what you're saying? That's literally it. Oh. So how, how do you combat that? So if you've got, like, a spaceship full of people and they're all feeling over-socialised, what, what, what on earth do you do about that? So... One of the things that's happening at the moment is you really think about who's going to space and you do loads of compatibility tests. So at the moment, it's not much of a problem because the types of people that go to space are extraordinary. We have very skilled pilots and engineers who are, have been embracing very difficult situations. They've been practicing and training. Whereas if you go to Mars, it's going to be people like you and I who are just sick of each other. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So we, we're going to be we're going to be talking about the Dear Moon project a little bit later on. So will those kind of effects kick in on that on like a short journey like that? I mean, it's like four days, but still, it's a confined space with with people that aren't like your superhuman Tim Peaks and mm. Alex Girth and all the rest of them. It, as in, they've not been picked because of their psychological suitability. Are they gonna Are they gonna freak out? Are they gonna flip out? Depends on what they're going to do there. What are they going to do? They're going to lean out the window and do some painting. Paint stuff. <laughs> yeah. Finger painting. Think about well, that's, that's, ideas, that's a short-term solution, isn't it? Keeping yourself busy. So if it's a couple of mm. days and you're running, doing little projects, then you probably don't have time to feel lonely. That's very true. So how, how, quickly, does it kick, how quickly does loneliness kick in? Well, it's very so individual. I'm quite lonely now. Do you? Yeah. It's because I'm We're here. all with Matt, aren't we? <laughs> I feel a bit scared after your over-socialising comment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, how long does it take to, to kick in? Well, it's very individual. So 50% of loneliness is actually genetic, which is quite interesting. And 50% is environmental. So you can train yourself to accept loneliness. How do you train yourself to accept loneliness? What's your, what's, your tip, what's your three tips for, for, for all us lonely space geeks? Well, first of all, you have to understand what it is. Right. You have to understand that it's an evolutionary tool and it was designed for hunter-gatherers to, to be safe, right? But it's not really a problem anymore. You don't need to be in groups of people to, to survive. But our monkey brain is still behaving like thousands of years ago. So actually understanding what it is and the fact that everybody here feels lonely sometimes and it's normal and life is not about chasing happy joyous moments but it's the fullness of it that's actually quite helpful and and, and that and so that applies to sort of deep space flight for like six months journey to, to mars absolutely in... because if you don't know what loneliness is you're going to be craving for human connections that you left behind. And does it also coincide with the mental health issue of people missing weather back on Earth, food and their loved ones? Right, yeah. And, but there are some things, little things that you can do. So, for example, have you heard that recently they had an exhibition of paintings on the space station and it's the paintings with the green landscapes and blue water, mm. stuff that actually reminds you um, of the Earth is quite helpful. And didn't Tim Peake have uh, running programmes where he could be running through the Scottish Highlands um, and it just made him feel like he exactly. was a bit more connected? Exactly, no, but like that, that. that's the number one thing they miss. And food, of course. I think, um, I mean, Matt, if you go two days without pizza, you start uh, I scratching go, I, the walls. I go, I go crazy. <laughs> what would you do? Freeze-dried pizza, I know. <coughs> Freeze-dried pizza. Yeah, yeah. solved. Have Lip you seen up. one of those 3D printed pizzas for space travel? No. 3D printed space yeah. pizza. Who's seen this? Oh, of course, you. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> he has, he just wants to. 
wants to put it just wants to because he's lonely (laughs) yeah it's okay the interplanetary podcast is always here for you the interplanetary I was just making sure you lot were still awake (laughs) half of you are I tell you we haven't mentioned Elon Musk recently we We haven't I know, I need someone to go and get me one. So, Alicia, what, what will the research from Mars Nation do? Where will it go? Um, so we're looking, yeah, Apart from exactly. Mars. Clever clocks. <laughs> it's the research. That's why it's the research. We don't know where it's going to go. That's true, that's true, very true. <laughs> <laughs> but any ideas? Um, so we are prototyping loads of different types of solutions for different uh, parts of loneliness. So one is understanding what it is, another one is connections, and the third um, one is um, things like um, embracing loneliness and maybe um, helping other people because when you detach yourself from your ego, you connect with others, which is a really interesting way to solve loneliness. So for each of the three pillars of what loneliness is, we're designing three or four solutions and just sticking half-baked ideas in front of people to design fast and iterate. Oh, that wow. is quite interesting, because actually mm. Matt's ego, I mean, yeah. it's, out, it's, it's out, huge. It's literally out of control. It is out Hence of control. we're doing this. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm a bit worried, actually. Is this live? I'm so lonely. It needs its own room. Yeah, it needs its own room. <laughs> it does. So, <laughs> so are you, when you said it was hereditary, could you actually, could you actually test for lo- the loneliness gene and therefore screen people out of a Ooh, space program? That's a really good idea, Matt. I don't think so, because loneliness is so... It's, it's not the literal how, how many or how little connection you have with other people. It's the perceived feeling. And because it's mm. a perception, it's very hard to quantify. But you said that it was, it was hereditary, so there may be a gene for it, mm. and therefore you could screen like a whole bunch of astronauts and just, now you're not going to space because you get too lonely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wonder how you can separate loneliness from all the other stuff in the Yeah, they might be really ace at flying and stuff like that. It'd be so annoying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So, so have you got any Mars Nation events coming up? Yes, so in a couple of months, um, November, we haven't got the date yet, but it's all going to be about loneliness. And whereabouts are you going to hold your... Here. Here. Oh, that's, that's a bit of coincidence. That is a coincidence. <laughs> well timed, Matt. Excellent. So and do come along. Alicia, if people want to learn more about Mars Nation, is there a website they can go to? It is. And it's quite simple. MarsNation.space. MarsNation.space. Can you have dot .space? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Guys, please big round of applause for Alicia from Mars Nation. So here we go, we've got a little bit of a rundown on a bit of space news. I have to say the Japanese have been absolutely kicking some ass. They have been killing it. So, yeah, have you been who's who's been following Hayabusa 2? It's it's been absolutely brilliant. If you don't follow it on Twitter, follow Hayabusa 2 on Twitter because it's doing some amazing things. So those who don't know what Hayabusa 2 is, it's a Japanese uh, spacecraft that's found an asteroid. It hasn't found it. It, it, it got launched to it, which, which is actually amazing. It's this little speck in the middle of the solar system, and it's managed to fly to it hmm. and, and get in orbit around it. And uh, it's called Ryugu, or something like that, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, we said Did it was a very Street Fighter 2. Yeah, it was a Street Fighter 2 character. Hmm. And, uh, but this week, or the week that's just passed, it managed to lob a thing down called Minerva 2, which was a canister that opened up and opened up and two little rovers, you can see them in that bottom picture there, two little rovers splashed out and they're now on the surface of an asteroid. So that picture on the top has been taken by one of those little round rovers that bounce around. So they they haven't got little wheels. What they do is they, they just kind of whir up a motor because the gravity's so little they can bounce around and take photos. So they're on on an asteroid it's right quite now. Quite a feat, isn't it? Yeah, isn't that amazing? So a round of applause for Hayabusa too. Yes. Woo. <laughs> But even more amazing. So Hayabusa 2, it's it's done that, but it's it's got more it's got more tricks up its sleeve. It's got 
another rover, a German rover, tucked in its little belly that it's going to drop down. It's going to drop on. down. And then it's going to release Minerva 2-2. Two, two. If that's a bit confusing. Isn't that just four? No, because Minerva 1 was on a previous so Japanese mission. And then Minerva 2 is split into two parts. Minerva 2 and Minerva 2-2. Two, two. But Good. Minerva 2-2's got another rover inside that's going to bounce around and take pictures. And then Hayabusa 2 itself will lower itself down to the asteroid, scoop up a little bit of dirt, then it'll go back up, and it'll, it fires like bullets into the, uh, into the, into the ground, and wow. then blows bits up, scoops as, as much dirt as it possibly can, and then will fly back to Earth and give us some of the samples off the asteroid. That is pretty mind-blowing, isn't, blowing, that, it's isn't kick, it? It's a kick-ass space program. <laughs> it really is. Well done, Hayabusa 2. So also in the news this week has been a, another Japanese uh, space company called iSpace who have uh, got a launch on a SpaceX or booked a launch with SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX are just going to drop them off in orbit and then they've got to make their own way to the moon. You might notice that Hitchhikers. That's, yeah, they're hitchhikers. It looks very, very similar to the lunar lander designed by the BIS, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So that, that design still lives on. That little rover that's popping out the bottom there is, uh, was part of the X Prize, or based on the X Prize that the same company was working on. So they hope to do that by 2020 and 2021. Which is pretty cool, isn't it? It is going to be a good year, that, isn't it? Yeah, so that, that's pretty scary stuff. Uh, and then next, the Jap still with the Japanese, today, a couple of uh, astronauts on the ISS managed to wrestle a massive HT-7 uh, cargo ship launched from Japan earlier on in the week and uh, drag it onto the space station. Uh, which is no mean feat. It must be pretty stressful with a little robot arm grabbing a stressful, pretty heavy object. <laughs> yes, it is. There they wrestle and grab. Yeah, like it's, that. True. it's true. It's uh, it, true. The astronauts have to use their own strength. It's not uh, motorized in any way. So uh, it's got <laughs> it's got fresh batteries on board. Yeah, that's always important. Double A's isn't it? or triple? It's uh, double A's, triple A's, yeah, and, and a, a nine volt, couple of nine volts. Yeah on board and uh, yeah the uh, the astronauts that are left on board there were supposed to be a spacewalk but the ones that were destined to do the spacewalk are going to go home next week leaving other astronauts to go and do oh, the spacewalk you'd be gutted wouldn't yeah. you yeah a bit annoying isn't it, it would be gutted so yeah there's this space station is going to be left with only three astronauts uh, next week uh, a german a american and a russian Sounds like the start of a joke. Yeah. <laughs> if you know one, I mean... Yeah, does anyone know a it. German, American? No. Walk into a bar. <laughs> Float into a bar, damn. Float into a bar. Uh, and one said, what do you do if you see a spaceman? Go on. Park in it, man. Oh. Right, anyway, so... I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, Malati, who was the singer of the band Mardis... Hello, Malati. Hey, Malati. There she is. We interviewed her dad, Ben Brahm, because he designed this amazing space telescope called Gaia. And Gaia's been in the news. Um, it, he was seriously influential in making Gaia even happen. And Gaia is the most incredible piece of gear. And Malati's dad literally was the cool guy that absolutely got it working. So we should... Let's have a applause. round of applause. Malati's dad, Brahm. come on. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> legends. But get this for cool. So remember Humuamua. Humu Say that Humu once again, Matt. Humuamua. <laughs> I love that you pronounce the H. Yes. <laughs> Humuamua. Well, I think they missed a trick because Arthur C. Clarke wrote about a story about an interstellar travel almost exactly the same as what happened with Hamuamua. Convenient. Convenient, huh? So anyway, um, Hamuamua came in from, it was the first spotted object from another solar system. And it's that cigar-shaped thing in the right-hand picture there. And very, very clever scientists from where, where are they from? I'm sure I've, I've put this in my notes. Uh, Baller and Jones et al. have written a paper for the Astrophysics Journal, and they reckon that they've narrowed down four so possible solar systems, possible homes that Oumuamua came from, which I think is absolutely incredible. As in, 
from all the billions of stars in the galaxy, they've kind they think that they've nailed it down to a possible four candidates. That is pretty incredible. Yeah. And not only that, Gaia has been in the week in the news again because it's managed to kind of capture a ripple in our own galaxy where we've had a close encounter with another galaxy and it's sent a sh little shockwave through the galaxy. Like Tommy and Cooper. Yeah, Tommy, it's a shockwave. And uh, yeah, it's managed to capture that. So a couple of things out of all the data that's pouring out of Gaia is in the news. So that's pretty cool. Does anyone remember the chocolate bar called Ripple? It's good, wasn't it? Just, you just reminded me of that. We're about to speak about Mar uh, Milky Way and then Galaxy. Galaxy. Mars. Can we think of anything else? Spira. 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 M Mars. I don't remember that one. Was there ever a chocolate bar called Comet? Comet? No, I don't think you so. You must remember the Hamua Mua. <laughs> it's one of my favourites. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't eat a whole one. Uh, so, yeah, that's... No, it wasn't chocolate, it was a dart. Good. Oh. oh. <laughs> it was a reissue. He's right. sharing them to make you less lonely. There you go. So we've got another guest now. We have. We've got Kate, who's who we had interviewed. Where is Kate? Is she around? Where's oh she dear. gone? She's in the back there. She's talking, hey. nattering away. <laughs> it's all right. Corridor we've got, conversations. We got her up. We got her up. We got her up. So yes. Please welcome Kate. <laughs> Hello, Kate. Um, well, firstly, thank you for coming. And can you explain to people who you work for, what you do? All right, it's complicated, but basically, they the latest the latest thing is that I was participating in an analog mission as a crew medical officer, and we were pretending to be on the moon for two weeks. So wow. that's that's the latest one. And how did that work? What were you doing to pretend that you were on the moon for two oh. weeks? Okay, so first of all, we were in isolation. So, um, no sunlight, it was a confined space. So, in size, it was about the same as ISS, well, roughly. So, it wasn't a lot of space. We lived all together, there were five of us. Um, we, done, we did everything together. We didn't know each other beforehand, so it was an interesting experience in team dynamics. We ate layer food, which is freeze-dried food, like the astronaut kind of thing, which we had to rehydrate. How so, was that? Oh my God. Yeah, that's, um, not, that's not Please good. don't ask. <laughs> well, yes, it's, it's different, okay? Okay, understood. It's a, cha it's a challenge. So we were conserving water, so we might not have a shower for two weeks, um, but there were other ways of like, you know, keeping each other decent. Um, so, um, no Nicking sunlight. No, I don't know. Okay, I'm not. I'm not like native. Cats. I'm not. I'm not native speaker. I'm sorry, Kate. I, I was. Uh, I was in charge of everyone's safety and health, and I was like, "You stink." <laughs> like that. You Matt, definitely, you went longer when you went to Glastonbury that first time. Didn't well, you? Yeah, it was at least three weeks. Yeah, I mean, did, did anyone discover the roadie shower? No, no, well, no, we're all, we're all good. So we had techniques that astronauts probably use or everyone who is in confined space uses to conserve water, to make the ecosystem as efficient as it can be. And then we had regular exercise. So obviously you can't go out. There's not too much space, but you can still keep fit. So we had, well, luckily our commander, she was a qualified yoga teacher. So as a team building activities, we had yoga every morning. Wow. And sometimes it wasn't nice. <laughs> oh. So yes, and then we had breakfast together and then we ran a set of experiments together. So each of us had responsibilities, like on ISS. So we had hydroponics, we had our pets, which were cockroaches and Worms and crickets, yes. So we. What, what kind of pets are there? I mean, yeah. yes. So, well, they're pets that it's hard to keep alive. Oh, but yeah. baby worms are cute, right? Yeah, that's well, true. With their little eyes, they can come all bodies. In meteorite soil, they don't. They're not happy worms, oh, to be no, honest. Yes. Well, I can't just tell more because I'm not involved in that experiment, but. Uh, 
Apparently it was interesting for someone to know why they live for a certain period of time and what happens and why it happens. Okay, let me ask you, um, yeah. Alicia was talking about loneliness. Was there any feeling of loneliness within the group? So it was a very interesting team dynamics that we had uh, because we didn't know each other beforehand. But I think the fact that we all love space, well, bonded us. And we had mandatory team time together, so every week um, evening we would sit down and watch a sci-fi movie about space. And um, <laughs> out of five of us, I think there's only one person who, well, he wasn't particularly happy, but it got better with time. So he got an acquired taste for sci-fi <laughs> movies because there was no other option. What well, kind of movies are we talking about? So, um, Expanse. Okay. We, were, we were trying to watch Expanse every evening or so. We seen Arrival, you know, the, mm -hmm, about the yeah. communication. See, you liked that. I loved that. I, you hated I it. I hated we, it. We have basically every movie we ever see, you like. Apart from Blade Runner, we both agree yeah, on Blade Runner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then we, we watched Matrix, well, which is very, That's not really not space, space, no, but it's future and yeah, technology yeah. and it's a classic. So, yeah, things like that. So, lots of things. And in terms of loneliness, because we had to keep our um, outside world communication, well, we couldn't, so we had to cut everything, basically. We could communicate with our um, lecturers or our supervisors, mm -hmm. researching supervisors, by email. But that's about it. And uh, it was a bit difficult, because there is life outside, but actually you have the whole new life mm. in your little moon base. So, um, and you have to get on with people. So, okay, we've, we're going to mention Dear Moon coming up, which we're, I know we're both pretty excited by. But if you had to give any advice, having been through this, to the artists and astronauts going up, what would you, what would you say is the big tips? Don't go. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Definitely go. Don't go with someone who doesn't like sci-fi movies. Could be. Could be one. <laughs> okay, you put me on the spot. I, I don't have good advice. I'm full of bad advice. Um, <laughs> That's alright. Yes. That's alright too. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, being honest with people, I think it's important. So if something is wrong, you say what bothers you. Um, and then you can work all together to fix it. Because if, if something is wrong and you don't communicate, well, people are not mind readers. So luckily we had an amazing team and um, everything worked out so well. So I made great friends, hopefully lifelong friends now. And uh, we were all very different, but uh, we all learned something from each other and it was great. And if you could, would you join the Dear Moon mission? Absolutely. I don't, I, I don't know much about it, but it sounds great. How long does it take? <laughs> you have to, you have to, be, an, days, have to be an artist. Yeah, about five days, man. Five days, oh, yeah. I'm, so, I'm so artistic. I just, ex uh, yeah. Exactly. I just discovered it right now. We'll, um, let, we'll let Elon know. Oh, because you've been, okay. you've been in Great! Yeah. Oh, my God. Great. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, five days is good. Five days, yeah. Yeah, so you were telling us, because uh, obviously you talked about this before you went in, yes. before you popped in. So your experiment, if I'm, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, was to see if you could operate remote telescopes from the moon. Yes. So how did that go? Well, it's, it was a very interesting experience because um, I had to, um, well, I had to communicate with my crew um, commander to arrange time, because it's, it's a six hour slot. So we had to move my schedule around because every day we had a fixed schedule for every team member to follow. So that day when I actually got the slot from the telescope people, um, we had EVAs. So it was a bit busy day already. And I had to talk to her and explain that things happen and we had to rearrange it. And I had to stay most of the night awake and I didn't sleep very well for the rest three of hours that I had. And um, the team had to support me. And um, 
Yes, it is possible. The answer is possible, but um, it's harder than it <laughs> looks. Yeah. So you actually, so you did actually get some really yes. useful data from that. Yes, from that I did. Yeah. I did. Uh, but to my surprise, actually, um, I was running a few more experiments. So I was handed over some other research from other people from the previous missions. So the workload yeah. was. Uh, a lot heavier than I expected, or I don't know what I expected, to be honest. I think from the conversation we had before, I didn't know what to expect. So we just showed up and uh, there was lots of data collection. There were lots of tasks that we had to perform, including EVAs, which is extra vehicle activities. Matt knows all so, about it. Yeah. Yes. We talk yeah. all about so it. we would uh, put our spacesuits on and do all the checks and we had special protocol to follow and it's it takes time. It takes time and effort even though you're performing something really simple but with all the bulky equipment mm. it becomes quite challenging. Yeah, we were talking about do, that. Do you, do, yeah, did you actually start to hate your spacesuit? Uh, well, we wish that we could wash it, maybe, or <laughs> like, yeah. no, not in the sense, but like moon dust. We had moon dust issue, so it exists even, well, on yeah. imaginary moon. Um, so yes, and it's yeah, it's it's very different experience. <laughs> so, like, are I, there any other projects that you've got coming up in the next sort of few months that you can talk about, or? Well, I will be applying to participate in some projects, uh, but I'm also going to be, mm, I hope to work with the same Lunaris uh, and um, their managing company, uh, Space is More. I'm going to, I hope to work more with them uh, to maybe create some improvements of the existing simulation because it's a great foundation. Uh, they have great facilities there. It just can get better, isn't it? it? There's always possibility to become something bigger. That's so inspiration yeah. for us all, I think, isn't Absolutely. it, Matt? Absolutely. Is, is anyone out in the audience want to ask Kate a question? Uh, yes, Eric. Eric. How did you get on to this program? Uh, I think I knew one of the organizers, yes. So I've met um, Agata uh, Kaldeshuk, who was um, science director at the moment. And I thought, oh, she's doing something interesting. I want to join in. And luckily, um, I did. So for some bizarre reason, uh, I was suitable. And actually, I'm surprised that it worked out very well. <laughs> Any yeah. other questions? Yes. I was wondering what the actual habitats looked like for both inside and outside, and also how you simulated the lunar surface. Yes, yeah, so um, on our Facebook page, which is called Learn Mission, yeah, uh, there are lots of photos, but it was like a modular kind of environment, which, uh, well, it does remind you something that uh, it's artificial. It's artificial environment. So we had a pod where we had our kitchen and eating facilities. We had a pod with our uh, 3D printing and other equipment. We had our hydroponics and bio lab with some stuff. And we had a separate thing there where we slept. We had like a bunk bed situation. Okay. So yeah, it was, it was different. So you, it's not like a just normal house where you live and at least it looked different. And we had um, special lighting that you could adjust um, to create some moods, I think. So it was quite useful. So you could make everything look very spacey. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, or, uh, yes, and the moon. Um, so we ha there was like the special made moon um, simulation in a hunger. So it was a big, big area that the company made quite realistic, to be honest. It was really interesting. Okay. Um, and it was always dark. So using just a head torch, trying to perform some tasks. Was, yeah. it, was, there, was there any reason why you had to be kept in the dark? Because it you know, it's not dark on the lunar not surface. Not always, but um, you know what? It just creates something else. Okay. It just, 
Yeah. We have yeah. one more question from our lonely boy in the middle. Yeah. Hey, lonely boy. Well, <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> it's just an interesting question because with all the bulky equipment that we had, with boots and few layers of suits, it's hard to be fast. It really is. We actually had Moon Olympics where we had to perform some jumping and running. And I think everyone hated it because, uh, first of all, the, the surface is uneven. So they created it in a way that it's not just plain regolith. It has like hills. And you run in your big, big, massive shoes and you think, nope, that's not running. That's just, that's just sad. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I think that's all we've got time for. Please, big round of applause for Kate. The Interplanetary Podcast. It's getting yes, better. It is getting better. It really it's is. Because they're getting more drunk. Because we're gonna. Matt, who's that guy at the, at the at giving at the the, uh, the the piggyback? Who is that? What did you say? <laughs> Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. Drink. Elon Musk. Now, does anyone know the name of the person who's on his shoulders? He's very rich. He's a billionaire, yes. Anyone know his name? It is Yusaka Muzawa. Yusaka Muzawa. And hands up, anyone hasn't heard of Dear Moon? Really? Okay. Well, Matt, do you want to, do you want to briefly explain? Well, yeah, it, it would seem that this guy has got so much money, he's convinced Elon Musk to let him ride... His rocket, the BFS, which flies up on a BFR, round the moon um, in 2022, 2023, or something yeah. like that. And uh, he's going to take a bunch. <laughs> yeah, right. He's going to take a bunch of artists with him. That's the whole idea. He's going to take a whole bunch of artists to go around the moon. So I've got a question for you all. If you were going to take an artist round the moon, who would you take? Who would you choose? You've got one. You've each got one. Go, we've got one. Paul McCartney. You take Good. Paul McCartney. <laughs> Good, yeah. You don't, you don't think he might be a little bit old for space flight? No. He's, he's like a great granddad. Yeah. Yeah, no. okay, yeah, fair enough. Macca's yeah, yeah. going up. Macca's on board. Macca's on board. Who else, Chris? Can they be dead? They yeah. can be dead, yes. Bowie. Bowie. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. It's so <laughs> annoying. Uh, anyone else? Yes. You take your wife. Oh. Is she an take artist? Take my wife. She is an artist. <laughs> Matt. <laughs> no, seriously, take my wife. Take my wife, please. <laughs> He's had a beer. So um, any other artists? We probably take Steve, actually. Yes. Steve? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah definitely. Steve, look at it. Look at how there we go. Look excited. Excited. He's very excited. He now, Matt, to flip reverse that, mm -hmm. Who would who would we want to go up if we knew the mission was going to fail? Blow up. <laughs> Sounds horrible, Which, but hey, I know I'm I horrible know guy. So Trump, we have Trump. Trump yeah, we've no, got Trump. Trump's no on board. Who else? I know. Who? Gove, Boris. Gove, so they're, Gove. they're on. Yeah. We, amazingly, else? we put Farage, Boris, and Gove. <laughs> there. Matt, don't don't read out the next <laughs> oh, words. Oh yes, and <laughs> that was our personal <laughs> notes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Mr. Worldwide Pitbull. He is an artist. I, I was going to send Bono. Who's up for Bono? <laughs> yeah, Bono can go. Bono up. definitely. <laughs> stupid purple glasses. So, wh what does what does everyone think? What do everyone think of Musk sending artists around the moon? Do anyone think? Drink. It's a drink. It's a it's a drink. Okay, fair enough. He is just selling a rocket ride. Yeah. And would anyone like to hazard a guess, by the way, I don't know the answer, to how much uh, this Japanese businessman has paid to take uh, a bunch of artists and himself? Do you know how much that might be in total? What do you reckon, Jerry? Oh, it's got to be a few hundred Yeah, I, the, the, I've heard 200 million, that's what I heard, was, was roughly what they reckoned it must be. 
It seems cheap, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's what he's saying. But then he has gone... But then Musk... Has gone mad. So we should, re- we should mention Elon Musk. He's, he's, actually, he's actually now almost on the verge of being arrested for, for fraud. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and the worst thing is, like, obviously, we're massive Elon Musk fanboys, right? Drink. Drink. Yes. And we love Elon Musk. He's great. <laughs> it's annoying. Everyone's like, oh, he smoked pot. Oh, come on. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, poor old Elon Musk. Hey, Matt, we yes. should mention Edgar Mitchell. Yes. Because we want, if, if we do send a politician up, wouldn't it be great for, for them to just... Look at the earth and say, Yeah, what did he say? Look at that, you son of a bitch. That's right, Edgar Mitchell. Look at that, you son of a bitch. Thanks, absolutely. Now, Matt, in the notes here, you've written Willy Wonka Golden Ticket, and it's the only thing that I, I don't know what you mean. Willy Wonka, because I, I reckon yes. you could actually you could raise the money for, B, for, for the BFR by having like a golden ticket somewhere. Yeah, like, because you know, it's like Willy Wonka all over again. Do you think there would be a c- another case of fraud there somehow? No, because... No, no. It worked in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I don't see why it won't work in this particular Matt, instance. you know that was a film, don't you? No, it's oh, a documentary. Come here, come here. <laughs> It's okay. The Show's over. <laughs> yeah, that so is, that is I, so exciting. I, I, do you know what I put in the, in the notes, which was a little bit depressing and I, when I just read it just then? Go on. Where it's like, is the reason why we're sending artists to the moon... It's because there's no more science to be done there. Oh, man. No. Surely not. No, okay. <laughs> so, no, I think it's a great idea. I think, I think sending a bunch of artists, because Alicia actually said this earlier on, space flight's a little bit boring sometimes when, when it's just a bunch of astronauts going on a truck up to the International Space Station. Oh, yeah, so, so boring. So, it, uh, yeah, maybe like sending a bunch of crazy, nutty artists up would be really good. It would be quite interesting, wouldn't yeah. it? Exactly. He might actually do something decent that he hasn't done for 30 years. <laughs> First two albums are great, but I'm actually, my vote. Wait a minute, did you say Bowie or? Oh, thank God, because I was, I was about to flip the desk. <laughs> said Bono. We're friends again, we're friends again. Yeah, yeah. I want uh, Jodie Foster, of course, would be a good one, because she, uh, she utters one the famous. One we both agreed on, Matt. Yeah, she utters the famous line they should have sent poets. Where was she from? Uh, um, North Yorkshire. <laughs> um, we both agree that they should send David Lynch. David Lynch. Imagine the oh. kind of... Maybe he'd come back and make just a normal, unconfusing film. <laughs> you know. What about Brian Blessed? Yeah. Oh. Got to send Brian up, haven't we? That's it. Brian Let's Blessed. have a round of applause for our favourite podcast guest ever, Brian Blessed, please. <laughs> Done here as well. Done here. Done here. Yeah, done here. What an the absolute... Interplanet- the Interplanetary Podcast! <laughs> yes. This is so panto now. I love it. Yeah. I've only got one... Oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> oh, good. Good. <laughs> there's only one more... I asked for that. There's only one more guest I would send, and that's... And I have to say it's William Shatner. That's Shatner. who I want to send into space. The Definitely. Shatner. Definitely. I, I was going to bore everyone and do this kind of, look at this spaceship, this is what it looks like now. And oh, look, it's got massive fins at the back and uh, they're going to be help it slow down in the atmosphere of Mars. And they're also its landing legs. Is that your nerd voice? Yes, or? it's my just nerd voice. To, okay. no, it's, it's, but then I realised, actually, the design's going to change again because yeah. it's changed like every year that he's they're done They're probably so. going to put the Interplanetary Podcast on the side of it. That should be the last time we do yeah, that, okay, shouldn't yeah, it? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yes, it a massive piece of news this week that came out. Um, yeah, Tory Bruno, and I have to say, Tory Bruno. If you haven't watched this video, Tory Bruno is on Smarter Every Day, and he allows the guy from Smarter Every Day to to have a a, a go traveling on the moving gantry that covers the Delta IV Heavy. And it's absolute. And you realize that Tory Bruno is an absolute legend. But Tory Bruno has literally gone to Amazon and bought the BE4 rocket engine for the next 
ULA launcher, and that is like super huge news in the space industry because it's. Has kind he of got Amazon Prime, or would he, he just get he, a free delivery for that? <laughs> so you know, how does it work? Look at this. Look at these poor. Look at these poor buggers in the Amazon warehouse. Oh no! Oh, in the Amazon warehouse, how much of a pain in the ass is how that? How do you to package deliver? that? That is a lot of cardboard. It's a lot of bubble wrap, isn't it? <laughs> um, also in the news, this chap, yes. Matthias Mora, who, uh, look look where he is, Jamie. We've been there, haven't we? Yeah, the we European have. The European Astronaut Time. Training Centre. And, uh, yeah, he trained with Tim Peake, and he's officially been made an astronaut. <laughs> so we have a new European Congratulations, astronaut. Congratulations, yes. Matthias. And he actually, at one point, went to the University of Leeds. Did he? Yeah. Went to do you want to do your Yorkshire accent again? No. No. Okay. I don't, I don't want to do it. And we should also mention another super huge British success story, and that was this remove debris uh, space net. I, I, am I going to dare play this video and see if it works? Because it, it's, it's pretty epic. Matt, it's working. It is working, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here where it... See, it fires out a little tiny um, satellite, and then this is the first time ever that someone successfully tried to do something about space debris. And that was built, weirdly, in Guildford, where all, all of us are from. <laughs> the band and myself all met, met in Guildford. And that, that satellite is made in Guildford. And it's a remarkable um, uh, piece of... It's, it's just... It's absolutely genius. And it's got a few more experiments to go. It's got a little harpoon to go and a few other things. But it's, it's Europe's first real proper attempt at trying to sort out the uh, debris problem. Big up, remove debris. Let's have a round of applause for it. I mean, why not? <laughs> We're all about eco. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of unsung space story. Uh, which leaves us one last thing to do, and that is space fact of the week. Yes. That's it. And then you can all go home and go, thank God. Thank God that's over. Right. <laughs> So, we're back to Gaia, and we're only back to Gaia because we've got daughter of Gaia here. And uh, so, I thought it'd be fitting to that say... That sounded very Marvel, Matt. Yes, it was. Daughter, daughter of, of Gaia! Gaia. <laughs> and they will be playing out with a few songs. Oh, actually, get this. Jerry passed me a piece of paper. Were you aware, Malati, that when you were doing the Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun, a tribute to Parker Solar Probe, no doubt, were you aware that it was actually right now having its 50th anniversary as a song? No. Yeah. Yeah. True so Dare. True Story, released in 1968, of course. The year of Apollo 8. So, so Matt, here we go. Shall we do some Gaia facts? Gaia facts. Okay, check this one out. So this is a picture by Gaia, but I, I, this if is a you pic actually look, oh, it's not just noise on there. Every single tiny speck is a star that Gaia has photographed, measured, measures its movement and everything else. So Gaia is going to observe one billion stars 70 times over five years. So that's an average of 40 million observations a day. Matt, I liked how you said million. Million. So Matt, one billion stars amounts to about one percent of the stars populating the Milky Way. You like that? Yeah. Anyone like that? One billion yeah, yeah. is one percent of the Milky Way. <laughs> and of you know when Matt <laughs> likes something because his voice does that. Yeah. Get this. And out of that billion stars, Guy is going to measure the distance of 99% of them with extreme accuracy. So it's going to be the greatest map of the galaxy ever achieved. Well, I've got a question from... Have we got... It's what? Yeah, you know, that's just that's good advice. Subscribe to our YouTube oh, channel if yes. you didn't know we have uh, one. We should actually do a shout out to all the patrons as well that have oh, been, yeah, please. That basically helped pay for all this and the booze and the snacks. I mean, and, if you didn't know, guys, you can stuff. actually give us money for the podcast. Yeah. Not you guys. You're, you look so happy. <laughs> Some of you do, actually. Yeah, Some of, we, yeah. we have patrons in the room. That's very right? true. That's absolutely shout out. Hands up if you're a patron. There we go. God bless you all. Obviously, th <laughs> you can join those hands up. Yeah, you can join. <laughs> that there are there's loads of patrons in the room. But, it's, but most importantly, go to iTunes and subscribe. Give us a nice five-star rating. That does the best thing ever. 
And yeah, we've we've been streaming this on YouTube. We've got a pathetic YouTube subscription at the moment. So maybe, yeah, maybe you could subscribe on that. Do a just push it hard now and do it. We're smashing ten viewers. Smashing ten, ten. viewers. Yes. That's going. That's t- well, that that almost doubles our subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, the Interplanetary Podcast. So, we're going to bring the band back Let's on. bring the band back. <laughs> and they're going to... For one le- more time. Let's escape, Jamie, so we can Let's watch escape. this from the back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mardi.
That was Hysteric Echo. Um, I don't know where Matt is, but thank you guys for having us, Matt, Jamie. <laughs> oh, he's there. <laughs> Woohoo! It's such, a, such an honor to be here. Um, as Matt said, uh, yeah, our link, well, actually, he was my teacher. And then one day, he was teaching me um, tour management. And I just, because he was always talking about space, and I was like, oh, after like, I don't know, six months or something, I was like, Matt, did you know my father was, you know, Gaia? And I had no idea what I was talking about. And he was like, are you fucking kidding me? You tell me this now? All right, <laughs> cool, take it easy. Anyway, um, <laughs> one led to another, and they had an interview. It was really great fun for my dad as well, because it was his first interview ever, bless him. Um, yeah, he had, he, had, he had a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, Matt said, one day you'll, you'll play on the podcast. I was like, yeah, that would be cool. And um, now it's a year later, <laughs> finally we're here. But thank you so much for having us. And uh, we chose, we don't have um, space songs, but we chose our most spaciest songs, you know, to be in theme. Um, this next one is called Cuckoo. It's the pivot of the clock, the cuckoo stack, un calibre de pendulum, the door is shut.
drums, Pete Gally on percussion, Will on guitar, and we have Nora back on BVs for our, our last tune. <laughs> well, actually, it's completely not ours. <laughs> Thank you. 
is blue and there's nothing I can do Well, I can't think of a better way to end. So, yeah, thank you so much to the band. Bowers thank you to the Bli space. Thank you to the British Interplanetary <laughs> Society. A uh, big round of applause to the band and the BIS. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Thank you very much. And if and anyone wants... to Steve and everyone that helped, and Ian, but for helping out. Yeah, and if anyone wants a quick drink, in there I'm serving uh, Iron Brew and Southern Comfort Black. Classic. A classic. It's a new thing. It's all we've got left. It's, it's our new good. space brew. Question at the back? And a space simulator. What more do you guys want? Come on. Wow. We didn't advertise this. So while we pack down, you. Dock it. Do it, dock it. That's Everyone the new slogan. Give it a life, Putting life, the dock. Life, no. <laughs> life is not complete until you've tried a bit of docking. <laughs> get, get <right. laughs> So, so what happens? Matt's had his I second. I have no drink. idea why they're laughing, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, don't Google that. Um, <laughs> we. So uh, no, but seriously, thank you. Down, why don't you do it? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this, Matt, 100 episodes. 100 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're so cool. <laughs> See, we've been working on that handshake for weeks. Uh, but no, it's, it, it feels bizarre. And um, thanks. We, we're pretty surprised that anyone listens. <laughs> So this is Wicked. So thanks for listening. And that's it. Cheers. My God. <laughs> Mardis. Matt and Jamie. Woo. Oh, perfect.